bear with me this night. And uh, what I'll talk about today is uh, contracts, uh, some off-chain stuff, and uh, uh, random public goods. And uh, so this is kind of the first thing we'll talk about. Uh, the first topic will be smart contracts and execution. Uh, and the second will be uh, off-chain transactions and layering of uh, this type of blockchain technology. And the third thing uh, we'll discuss is uh, uh, this idea of uh, public goods and uh, random public goods. And uh, that will be kind of my um, uh, interesting new direction that I'd like to highlight at least. And uh, if we have time, we'll also talk about uh, are we decentralized yet? So this is one of my favorite uh, websites. You can go to are we decentralized yet? dot com. And uh, depending on how much time we have, then at the end, you know, we'll walk through this website together because I think it's a good learning experience. But if you're bored, then what you can do is, you know, you pop your phone and you write, are we decentralized yet? And, you know, you start looking at what's going on there. One word. Okay, so uh, what are smart contracts? <coughs> so one way to think about this is that there are programs that uh, have money in them. So this <coughs> is the programmable money. That's kind of one property that they might have. Uh, another property that they might have is that because they're kind of built on some sort of decentralized trust infrastructure, they're autonomous. So what does it mean to be autonomous in this sense? Well, they're safe. That means that they do what they're supposed to do and not something else that they're not supposed to do. That's kind of the safety property that we have from this decentralized trust. Uh, and they're live. Again, that means that they're doing what they're supposed to do and not doing nothing. It means that somebody can block them. So in a sense, kind of this uh, decentralized trust infrastructure, the way at least I understand it providing you with aut autonomy is it provides you kind of with uh, uh, safety and liveness guarantees onto what this contract is supposed to do. And kind of, you know, the, the hope is that this will uh, somehow uh, improve uh, legal contracts. That's kind of, you know, one big uh, aspiration. <coughs> and really the kind of idea is that this will uh, uh, disrupt the legal industry and maybe reduce some of the friction, some of the human interaction needed in this thing. And, you know, some people actually think that smart contracts are kind of the building blocks for new digital markets. And uh, this is kind of, uh, uh, I guess, the idea. But I guess the point here is that I want to make is that it's not that we want to completely replace everything and just say, you know, everything is now going to be a, some smart contract. But we want to kind of uh, look at the uh, successful things in law. And uh, uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that we will not replace very soon. But we want to see, you know, what things are still appropriate in, uh, in kind of the new world, in the new digital world. And, uh, you know, we believe that this will uh, kind of radically change what's happening. <coughs> and, uh, uh, you know, the question is kind of what's the best way to, uh, to uh, design uh, these online relationships. And uh, I guess here's the kind of the basic idea. So the basic idea of a smart contract is that many kind of contractual clauses can be embedded into hardware and software we can deal with in such a way that a breach of contract is expensive. Okay, so these are, uh, this is the idea that you can kind of take some sort of hardware and software contractual clause and instead of having law, you can somehow automate this so that breaching this contract is expensive for you. And so these are three quotes from the same blog post by Nick Zabo. This is the title of his blog post, Smart Contracts Building Blocks for Digital Markets. I recommend you <coughs> Googling it and reading the whole thing. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, article. And this is kind of where the name Smart Contracts came from, this blog post. And now people are kind of citing it. And I think uh, in Ethereum, this is uh, um, uh, the name of kind of what you run there is, is uh, um, smart contracts. And, and this is you know, one, one quote, which is, I quite regret adopting the term smart contracts. I should have called them something more boring and technical, perhaps persistent scripts. And this is uh, our friend uh, Vitalik from, uh, from this year. So, uh, you know, this is kind of uh, where smart contracts start from. They start from this uh, idea from 1996 where there was very little of an internet. Um, but uh, I guess uh, thought leaders were thinking about the idea of uh, uh, taking the best of what contract language has and, and what uh, the world has and embedding this into this new idea of uh, computers and combining hardware and software. So Nick Zabo already in 96 understood that there has to be some sort of hardware connection to uh, smart contracts. And so what I want to do is kind of focus 
more on, a, on a, um, a smart contracts and kind of the lens of uh, distributed computing. And so I'm going to touch on uh, uh, three aspects. So I'm, I'm first going to uh, mention this uh, uh, wonderful work uh, by Barbara Liskov and her students, uh, which is called BASE. And this is kind of, uh, for me, the base for all these execution engines. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, blockchain and GDPR, because I think that's also an interesting uh, thing to, to discuss. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the way uh, blockchains maintain information. And this is kind of this distinction between the UTXO model and the uh, account model. I know how much of you uh, know. So some of you might know more about each one of these topics. So I'll kind of go over this. Um, so uh, th this is, uh, uh, again, a very important paper in my mind, uh, uh, using abstraction to improve fault tolerance. This is a paper from uh, 2001. Uh, uh, Barbara Liskov, together with uh, Rodrigo Rodriguez and Miguel Castro. Again, uh, a very important read in my mind, uh, which uh, basically uh, what it does, it combines the idea. So this is, uh, you know, Two years after uh, Barbara and Miguel uh, uh, published PBFT, which is the protocol that implements a practical Byzantine fault tolerance, they said, okay, so what can we do with a, with a practical fault tolerant implementation? Well, what we can do is we can actually do a, a general abstract machine that can implement anything we'd like. And so this is kind of the, the high level idea to combine a BFT system, not just with a distributed ledger, but actually, so a distributed ledger is just recording the commands but actually building a generic execution engine on top of this distributed ledger. And again, this is all 2001, um, you know, before the, the cryptocurrency uh, hype started. And so, yeah, base, the, it's an acronym for, for the acronym BFT with abstract specification encapsulation. And, you know, if you don't uh, know uh, uh, Barbara Liskov, she's a Turing Award winner. Uh, she has an amazing Turing Award winning uh, lecture, which I also recommend you all to see. It's again about abstractions. And she's very, very good and clean and clear about it. Uh, and really the idea in, of this paper is that you can implement a generic state machine interface. So what does that mean? It means there is a, a, a BFT engine underneath, but what it's actually implementing is some sort of generic state machine. And you know, you, it's a kind of a, obvious thing, but from a software and engineering perspective, it's kind of uh, what they built, and it allows you to build on top of a distributed ledger any type of execution engine that you want. And, you know, their point was this enables code reuse because you can implement many different things, many different types of state machines on top of a Byzantine fault tolerant system. And so what they have here is kind of this uh, two-phase uh, 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 scheme, where in the first phase, uh, the client defines his own state machine. So the client has to kind of define what are the interfaces, what are the commands, how the data is stored. Uh, in particular, you define uh, a, a set of commands, and you define how these commands change the state. So basically, you're defining a state machine. And you also define a set of queries. So queries, you think about them as read-only queries. Uh, and this is how uh, this state responds to queries. So you can provide this definition. Um, and, and you know, this is a deterministic uh, state machine. And once you have that, then you can uh, 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 execute this, and then there's a runtime. And in the runtime, instead of saying that commands are just appended to a log, the clients send commands and queries, and now the block doesn't just record the commands on the block, but it actually has an execution phase. So what is this execution phase? It means that after the commands and queries are ordered in the block, there's an execution that takes these commands and uh, uh, queries and processes them. So for each command, it actually operates this command on the current state to get the new state. And for each query, it computes the output of this query. And then the return value of this block of commands is the complete new total state and also the responses of all the queries and all the commands if they have responses. Yeah, so in the sense, they built this thing, so this is software that actually works. And, um, you know, they, def they defined this, a particular version of this. But from a kind of a theoretical perspective, I think um, uh, it's, it's the system aspect of it. It made, the, oh, was it, it wasn't deterministic? Yeah. 
Yeah, it could be anything. Okay, well, you know, and I think the, the next, the, you know, this is also like underneath it is a BFT protocol. So I, I guess you know, this combining, I guess, this idea of an abstract data type with, um, with, a, um, with a BFT engine. I guess that's, you know, you could say if you know that, then it's kind of a one line. Um, yeah, and so the runtime, basically, you have a BFT engine that maintains a replicated state machine. Uh, and, uh, and so what I, my point is that uh, one of the nice things that you can do here, again, you know, this is not surprising if you're in this area, is that the state machine itself can be uh, a generic state machine, right? So the state machine that you're providing can actually be some sort of a, a, a machine that you can then write code onto. So your command is actually pieces of code. Um, and so, yeah, for example, the state machine can be some sort of Turing complete virtual machine. Okay, so now your commands are pieces of code and the execution of this uh, state machine is executing pieces of code on the state machine. All right, so basically you're running kind of a virtual machine on top of this kind of general construction and on top of a Byzantine fault tolerant machine, uh, state machine. Okay, so this is kind of the idea of uh, a base. And, you know, if it looks similar to what uh, you maybe uh, know about Ethereum, it's, it's not surprising. And, you know, this is, these ideas have been uh, around uh, from the 70s and, and even earlier. And, again, this is kind of this idea of having layers of abstractions of execution. And, yeah, you can choose other types of languages. So, in particular, you don't have to choose a, you can choose a domain-specific language. So, maybe Bitcoin has a specific kind of language called Bitcoin script that, that is maybe more limited and maybe you prefer these types of domain specific <coughs> languages. Maybe you want a language that's very good for verification and so on. So you can choose on top of this type of abstraction to build uh, the type of language that you want. Yeah, I mean, I guess I think about it as the upper layer, but yeah. So, but yes, higher the higher level, yes, uh, yes. So they did. So they didn't. They did not. But but later later work allowed you to kind of do a hard fork of the of the EVM that you want to run or the. You had a question. That's a great question, and we'll discuss it a little bit later. But uh, for now, I'll, I'll just say that you define commands and how they mutate the state. And I need to execute, depending on this command, it has to be deterministic. Um, but yeah, so we, we can discuss. So the naive, simple, easy thing is to do th everything sequentially. Otherwise, you run into deterministic, into challenges in, in, de in being non-deterministic. So I guess the real, I think, to me, the challenge is not concurrency, it's more about whether it's deterministic or not. Uh, that's, that's kind of uh, the, the challenge, but we'll get back to it. Could you clarify what you mean by state machine can still be a state machine? The commands to the state machine can be commands that implement another state machine. So if, um, if we draw an analogy from the Ethereum world, uh, it would be like saying that using Ethereum smart contracts on top of EVM, we can implement another version. Of yeah, you can so implement a token on top of uh, tokens, right? For example, so token as a state machine on top of EVM. As a state yes, machine. yeah, that's example. A token, a, a ERC twenty token is like a state, a small state machine on top of a, mm -hmm. the EVM state machine, which is doing something similar, right? It's paying and so. I, you know, this idea is not new, but uh, but uh, I guess they did it very cleanly on top of a BFT system. And um, okay, so so that's one one thing that yes. So the one difference is that this is a permission system. Yes. Right. Yes, of course. Yeah, so I mean, uh, but I guess the idea here is that it's underneath some sort of uh, fault tolerant distributed ledger. And so you can replace the distributed ledger. This is kind of what we discussed yesterday. Yes? How do they improve? They don't improve. They just kind of show you how you can generalize. And so I guess my point is that there is two aspects here. It doesn't improve fault tolerance. It just does the following. It gives you an execution engine on top of a distributed log. That's all it does. 
and you might not like the distribution, the execution engine because it's too complicated and has lots of bugs. Uh, but then you can replace it. But basically what it's saying is you can have an, a generic, any execution engine that you want, you can build on top of, of this thing. Again, not very surprising. So one thing you can build on top of uh, uh, this is a blockchain data structure. So a blockchain data structure is a structure where one block points with a hash to the previous block, and that points to the hash to a previous block. And you know, I guess kind of uh, if you've heard about this uh, 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 right to be forgotten, this is part of the uh, uh, European Union general data protection regulation laws, which basically say that uh, what, what these regulators want you to do is be able to erase data. Okay, so if I, I don't know, subscribe to some uh, uh, service, maybe Facebook, and at some point I decide I don't want to be part of Facebook anymore, then uh, I, I delete, I delete, you know, I ask Facebook to delete my account, and Facebook actually has to erase uh, all content and somehow provably show that I'm not, that they're not still maintaining information about me and so on. This is kind of the right to be forgotten. And uh, I guess w my point is that uh, state machines can be replicated, uh, uh, can be a replicated blockchain. So your state machine can be a series of blocks where each block maintains a hash to the previous block. But if you do that, then essentially you're fundamentally locking yourself into a state machine that in which you cannot delete <coughs> things. Um, so this is kind of a, 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 an aspect where it is not clear that the only thing you want to do or implement in terms of an execution engine is a log that has a hash of one edge to the other. Sometimes you have to do it because you have, that's how your consensus algorithm works. But sometimes if your <laughs> consensus algorithm doesn't work this way, then you don't have to rely on this. And so you can uh, uh, do other things. For example, you can implement a state machine uh, that allows you to delete history from the state. And you just issue a command that deletes the state, parts of the state, and it will because it's implementing a generic state. All right, the next, uh, yeah. So we're not <coughs> storing the history of this machine, right? We're just storing the last state. Sorry? You cannot retrieve on the blockchain? Yeah, if I have state, the state is, let's say, all the history that I care about, and the command is erase some part of the history, then that, and everybody executes it, then that part of the history is now deleted, right? <laughs> From all honest nodes. So obviously, you know, if, if you've done something and I take a <coughs> screenshot and I don't delete it, then there's no way for me to force you to delete it. There's no way for, for you to force me. But I guess what we want to say is that we want to get to a position where all the honest nodes have deleted this information. Yeah, sure, sure. So but in that sense, the log is okay, right? You just change the key. It's okay if everything was encrypted <laughs> and you delete the key. Yeah, sure. That's that's another option. But if we have a transaction log, you're not. You don't have a transaction log. That's what I'm pointing. You have a, a generic state. You can decide what your state is. There is no transaction log here. So, you know, in this uh, uh, model, nowhere did I say there is a transaction log. There's a generic state. You, you, they apply to the state and yeah. only state you don't have to store this generic state, right? I mean, if we go to the next slide on blockchains and GDPR, if mm -hmm. you find blockchain as a... Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying if you do, do it as a blockchain, then it won't work. So I'm saying don't, do not keep blocks that have an edge to the previous one because that will not work. Then you cannot erase. That's the whole idea of the, you know, time stamping of... Uh, okay, so Yeah, I won't say the only way. I'm saying here's a way. I'm kind of illuminating and saying, look, you don't have to always store a chain of blocks. That's not the only state you can store. I mean, if we don't st store any history and cannot recreate history, then um, I mean, yeah, th th I guess th th that's what you're saying. Blockchain doesn't make sense here, right? Why? I mean, uh, if we just store the latest state mm -hmm. and nobody can recreate the previous states and check if they are bad, then we don't. I mean. It doesn't make sense to store the chain of hashes because... Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, we, that's... What, okay. I'll look at both of you and see who starts. <laughs> there are some work trying to do some sort of prune chain, but at the end, you know, you, the hashes need to work out. This is the whole idea of, uh, uh, you know, Stuart and, and, and Scott Sorrenta's uh, uh, time stamping scheme. Sure.
Sure, so I'm saying you cannot force, you cannot force the adversary to delete things. So, you know, if you try to understand what you can do, so the only thing you can do is make sure that uh, what honest parties store is what's required by the regulator. Uh, yes? So in practice, what's the status now of uh, GDPR versus blockchain? Is Bitcoin illegal or...? <laughs> I know this is like something that's uh, mind-boggling a lot of people. That's why I like to put this slide on and say, look, it's not a... I mean, basically, if you have a blockchain and you can't erase things, it's because it's built not to be able to erase. But on the other hand, you don't have to maintain a blockchain necessarily. Okay? You, you, if you want, you can have a, no, no, some other data structure. Practice right now. In practice right now, yeah, we, will go to, we will go to are we distributed yet and look at it later on. Okay? <laughs> and tell you, I'll tell you how, okay. Okay, how we're in practice. No, no, I, I haven't seen any solution. So this is just, uh, you know, this is just uh, thoughts for now. Yeah, yeah. That, so that's still a property that you maintain. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, again, you have a... You have a There's a transcript for the consensus. Or yeah, so, you know, this is, again, people that, come, that only learned about consensus from Bitcoin think that the only way to maintain state is by a chain starting from the genesis. But I'm saying that, you know, uh, uh, if you look at Byzantine fault tolerance in general, then you can, if you, you can separate these things. You can have a system that implements some sort of Byzantine fault tolerance consensus engine. And uh, separately, you can implement an execution engine. So it, it may be surprising for people who only, you know, only think about one way to do it. Well, to, those are two fundamental different ways to uh, get the state back. I mean, in, in that remote consensus, you don't have to trust anybody, just verify. I don't think, do n so the statement, you don't have to trust anybody, I think is misleading. I would go to, are we decentralized yet? Yeah, okay. And see that you're trusting four right. people. Yeah, so don't, so, okay, one thing I would recommend, hash power is not the truth. Yeah, the no, truth I, is I, what I you think, but, okay. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm very much not a okay like I mean, I, yeah, so, yeah, let's not go with truth. But it's, it's different from, like, saying then a BFT system that doesn't have records of the, of the past, just has a record of the current state, uh, like a snapshot of the state and the set of participants. Mm -hmm. That's a different trust model from Nakamoto. Very, very different. From Nakamoto, yes, you know, again, look, I'm trying to open your mind a little bit. I know, again, for somebody who's only seen one consensus algorithm in life, and then this is kind of, you know, illuminating. For people who have seen many, then it seems kind of very natural. So I, I, maybe that's why uh, we're having this discussion. So I, I want to focus on, like, how do a bit blockchains maintain their state? So they do maintain history from the beginning, but there's kind of a fundamental difference in terms of how they do it, uh, and there's kind of a divide between them. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, Bitcoin's a... Uh, uh, Traditional approach is this uh, maintain UTXO. UTXO uh, is kind of the acronym for unspent transaction output, where TX is kind of the uh, acronym for transactions. Um, and I guess the idea here is that you just maintain all the uh, tokens uh, that have not been spent. So anytime there is some token that can still be used, that's what I maintain. So I maintain a data structure that contains all the tokens that, that can still be used, right? So if, I, uh, if uh, A wants to pay a token T, then, you know, we first uh, uh, remove this uh, token that A paid uh, uh, from this list of used tokens because now it's, it's, we use this token. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll add now a new line to this data structure saying that now B holds this token. Maybe this token is mutated to a new token. But uh, this is essentially what you do. You maintain uh, in a data structure all the tokens that are valid. Okay, and essentially, in a way, who owns them, or like a public key of who owns them. So this is kind of one approach, and the nice thing here is that anytime you want to do a transaction, it's typically, uh, 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 you can do it in, in, in some sense in one line, because when you write that this token moved to that token, then uh, it basically implies that this other one is already deleted. 
And this is uh, one approach. This is the Bitcoin's approach. And then there's uh, uh, another approach, which is the Ethereum's approach. This is the account model. Um, and so here, instead of having uh, um, uh, these uh, unspent transactions, <coughs> every user has a special uh, place in, this, in the state. There's kind of a state for all the users in the world. And for every user, there is a, a, just a balance, which says how much money this user has. <coughs> and also, you know, if you need more state, you can, you can do more things than that. And when A wants to pay something to B, then uh, basically what you do is you decrease uh, A's balance and increase B's balance. balance. And you know, you, if you do this, you have to actually be careful to make sure this is atomic. As uh, you know, Morris showed uh, yesterday, if you implement some sort of account model on top of Ethereum, let's say DAO, and uh, this thing is not atomic, then you can get into re-entrancy problems where uh, these things don't happen together. You don't both de increase and decrease together. So this is kind of the second uh, approach for maintaining state. And uh, you know, th there are uh, differences and nuances in terms of efficiency uh, between them. And I'd like to also mention kind of a third uh, uh, approach, which is instead of maintaining all the uh, uh, allowable tokens, you can also maintain all the ones that have already been spent. So this is kind of a, a list of uh, nullifier list, which basically stores all the tokens that are, have already been used. And so this is sometimes used uh, when you want to maintain state and you want to maintain some sort of anonymity. So this way you, you kind of don't maintain what can be used because that might maybe leak information, um, but you can somehow hide what has been spent because when somebody exposes the coin, it's okay to publicly see it potentially. Uh, well, if it's not used yet, then you don't want to maintain uh, information about it. It basically means, yeah, spend. You can spend it. So, so think about spending in terms of the uh, abstraction, Eli, as if your token is eliminated and I get a new token. So this token is not really moving from you to me. Your token goes away and my token, a new token comes to me, okay, which is associated with my public key. So in that sense, the nullifier list maintains all the list of tokens that have been spent. Okay? Sometimes you have a way to, make, to, to know if tokens are created without, without having a list. Yeah, but, uh, so I'm just, you know, I'm, I guess I won't go into this. Maybe, I don't know, are you doing a talk about it? Okay, so two days from now, a day. Anyway, so I'm just stating this so that you remember this is, is I guess, more complicated than that. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, you can build a general execution engine. Uh, in, in Bitcoin has kind of a, a simple constant round language. So you can actually have some uh, non-trivial scripts there, but it um, essentially gives you a f uh, you know, one-way uh, script where, where you, can al you always have to make progress and you can make a few steps of computation along the way. And Ethereum is uh, essentially Turing complete, although it actually has kind of a bounded depth stack if you really look into it. But uh, the real question here that I want to raise is uh, when you have these uh, uh, general purpose execution engines, then you're now worried that maybe your execution is going to take you a long time. So you somehow want to limit the amount of uh, uh, power an execution has. And so what Bitcoin does, it just says, well, there's like a bounded number of steps it can take. Let's say maybe, you know, 20 steps. So um, any, any contract or any script that you run in Bitcoin has kind of a limited amount of uh, uh, rounds it can do. Uh, in Ethereum, since it's a generic scheme, you can have much more complicated uh, transactions. So you want to somehow limit the amount of computation that you do for every transaction. And so for this, uh, uh, Ethereum has this idea of a gas cost. And so there's kind of an absolute gas limit uh, for, a, for a transaction. There's actually an ex ex absolute gas limit for a whole block of transactions. But for now, just imagine that for any transaction, there's kind of a, an absolute limit for that. And any operation that you do uh, costs you money. So cost you this, uh, uh, you know, think about this as this new notion of gas. So every time you take a step in this uh, virtual machine, that costs you money. And maybe you know, some steps are more expensive than other steps. So there's kind of a, a varying menu of things. Is the length and complexity of Bitcoin scripts limited only by block size in bytes, or are there any additional restrictions? More restrictions? <coughs> so the script itself is kind of a one-directional script. So you kind of have to move essentially from left to right. So the number of steps really is, you know, say, bounded. Uh, yeah, 
No, no, I think there's, I think there's, uh, there's so I, for, I forgot the number, there's like 20 or, or so, there's some fixed number, small okay, number. Is, is it the consensus rule? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's part of the execution engine. So, binary supports that it's not part of the consensus. The binary can come with the source, it has a special script. But, uh, those won't be like Yeah, script. sure, so the... Okay. Yeah. So, so, so essentially, there is an execution engine that we all agree on, and this execution engine contains a few scripts, no, right? I mean, I want to emphasize that there are consensus rules in for in the consensus engine, and there are rules that miners or validators impose on what they include in blocks or not. Yes. So that's what interests me. The, the, li the limit on script size is it um, enforced by consensus engine, or is it enforced just by miners who just wish not to include the scripts for whatever reason, but technically they could. Okay, so what you're asking is the following type of question. Um, what I basically s proposed, at least in base, is that we all have exactly the same execution engine. And now you're saying, what if, you know, some of us has a different execution engine than others? No, no, the, the engine is the same. No, no, so but this, is, but I can this is exactly the what... The no, uh, yeah, so this is... The <laughs> well, so if you limit the types of inputs, so, you know, I think in, in Bitcoin there's kind of saying, here are some inputs that I allow and some inputs I don't allow. So allowing or disallowing inputs is part of defining the execution engine. Okay, that's part of the definition. So in the sense, that's why your question essentially is, what if there's some people who believe that uh, this execution engine should happen and some people believe that some other, and then typically there's disagreement. So typically that causes disagreement. Okay, so we're in the model where all miners get exactly the same set of transactions and apply them with the same way. The yep. Same set of yep. Um, yeah, so, so again, by limiting uh, every transaction in, in terms of some abstract notion of gas, uh, you get kind of a limited uh, compute and storage operations because every operation costs some amount. And, uh, 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 you know, the real question here is, like, how does this relate to the world where there are many clients? So what this does is at least make sure that one client cannot cause a transaction that takes too much time. Um, and if you th start thinking about this problem of many clients and the need to kind of regulate uh, the, the, the execution between many clients, you get into classic uh, operating system questions of scheduling, right? And, and there's yeah, tens of years of experience in, in scheduling operating systems, uh, uh, you know, fair, fair scheduling and priority and so on. But kind of in this new world, what's uh, I guess maybe different is that uh, you know, these miners are greedy <coughs> And it's just like, you know, your machine is basically saying, look, uh, maybe if Word and Outlook are competing, then if Word pays more, then, you know, your, your, your Intel CPU will let Word run more than the Outlook or something like that. Um, so whoever pays maybe gets um, more, more execution. And uh, the way this is typically done is that uh, um, the uh, clients, the ones that want to run execution, attach some notion of a tip, some notion of an additional payment connected to their execution and what this tip basically means is that if the miner chooses to add this piece of code into the execution then the miner gets this additional reward uh, for for the, this mining this block so this is kind of the high level idea it happens both in uh, Bitcoin and in the ethereum Yeah, so the, the, the actual mechanism that happens in, in, uh, in Ethereum is that you actually say how much you're willing to pay for each gas operation. But that's kind of, you know, a, a, a technicality about Ethereum. But the high level is there is some mechanism, you, you're completely right, there is some mechanism, though, to put some monetary amount into your transaction. And, you know, the miner can decide which commands to add to a block. And as you know, miners are... Uh, uh, want to help world hunger or just care for themselves. Um, and miners can uh, decide on empty blocks if they want to, uh, I don't know, damage the system. And actually, we've seen some of that happen sometimes. Um, and, you know, there is kind of a, a max gas limit to a block. So w w how do you, yes? So I guess my question is, you know, does this seem like a good idea to pay people to pay for, uh, for execution? Okay. If, if you don't do that, 
then you need some other kind of protection against denial of service attacks. Right. Yes, that's true. You need some mechanism for, for denial of service attack protection. Yeah, so it, it kind of gets this, you know, rich, uh, you know, it, it helps people who are rich, right? So if I have a lot of money and I want my transactions in, I'm going to pay more and uh, force other people uh, out, right? And so this is kind of not, uh, not completely absurd. How many people have heard of uh, FOMO 3D? Okay, good. So uh, 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 what is FOMO 3D? At the end, you know, somebody got 10,000 Ether. That's kind of the end of the story. Uh, and uh, basically, at the time, it was worth $3 million. So there's somebody made $3 million out of, photo, out of uh, FOMO 3D. That's kind of the high-level story. At what cost? At, uh, we don't know what cost. Um, you know? Good. So, so you know, um, this is, you know, uh, one way to think about it. this is a, a psychological experiment in greed, a war of attrition for those who kind of know this thing. And it's kind of a nice combination between a Ponzi scheme and the all pay auction. So this is an example of a smart contract in Ethereum. Some people say, you know, this is one of the important smart contracts that happened in 2018. So, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about it. But essentially, you know, it's the combination of your favorite two things, a Ponzi scheme and the all pay auction. A Ponzi scheme uh, is a scheme where basically <laughs> a pyram pyramid scheme. No, 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 don't tell him. Uh, I have a book. <laughs> <laughs> if you bring two more people who will ask this question. <laughs> so uh, in, in, a, in like the standard pyramid scheme, uh, you, you know these schemes? Yeah, I know. Okay, yeah. So in the U.S. it's called Ponzi because there's some guy, I forgot, Charles, Charles Ponzi. Uh, and he was like, he was really good at it. Um, but, you know, maybe pyramid is like, the pyramids go er earlier. That's true. That's true. So I'm going to try to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, are you going to talk about this? Uh, no, okay. So anybody? So I'm going to say like a few words about, you know, it's a lot of fun. I could spend a lot of time. I mean, go, go Google this thing. After you Google, are we decentralized yet? Um, but uh, basically, at a very, 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 very high level, it's rounds. It's a synchronous protocol. Um, and every round, uh, uh, if you're the last person that paid in this round and nobody paid for 24 hours, what happens? You win, you get the whole jackpot. Yay, so somebody actually won. That means nobody paid for 24 hours. And, and uh, okay, every time, every round, you have to pay a little bit more. That's the beauty of like an all-pay auction, right? So it's not just an all-pay auction, it's like an all-pay auction where every time you have to pay a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, this is the Ponzi scheme part of it or the pyramids part, part of it. In each round, there's kind of, you know, passive income from the pot. So every round, people pay, and the people who came in early get a little bit more money, and the people who came, you know, a little bit more late get a little bit less money. There's some sort of, you know, nice Ponzi scheme, so that pyramid scheme, so that the people who went in early get more money <coughs> than the people who, you know, went in late. <coughs> so it's this nice combination, and, you know, once you're in it, then you're kind of stuck because now you're saying, well, you want to wait so that you are in the best of the pyramid scheme, so you start making a lot of money. So you don't want anybody to, oh, to stop this game so that they will get all the jackpots. So all you need to do is see if, if somebody is the last person um, and he has 24 hours, then what do you do in the last hour? You pay up, right? So how, wh why am I telling you this story? Uh, how is it related to the previous slide? Yep. Yeah, so, so you know, you, you can go and uh, uh, Google this. Uh, there's like a few of them. You, you, some, some of you have read this. Uh, I think the, one of the blog posts called How the Winner Got FOMO 3D Prize. And uh, basically, he was very smart. There's a lot of things he did or this group did. You think they spent like $10,000? That's the... I think I'm right okay, I don't know. Anyway, it seems that they were pretty smart, not super smart, but basically they did something quite simple in, in the kind of basic thing, which is, when they realize it's very close to the end and they're the last guys, this is like the last hour and they are the last to, to pay, now what they do is they put into the blockchain a lot of transactions that do nothing but waste a lot of gas, but bid a lot for it. So they give a lot of tip, right? So you go to the waiter, to the, to the CPU, to your machine, and say, look, I'll pay you a lot of money to do nothing, 
for the next hour. Okay, and this really literally happened. So I guess um, you know this guy you know won this pot. So I guess the, the, my point here is that this idea of um, again paying for for execution has advantages, but it, but you have, have to also realize that people will gain the system uh, to do this. Okay, so um, I guess kind of at a high level. Uh, um, uh, we want to think, or the way I think about this is that blockchains are the new operating system. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at the old way operating systems worked or old way computers worked, you kind of punched your, your, your program into a card and you ran it and it either ran all or nothing. And, you know, new operating systems came in and had smarter scheduling. There are questions about can you do concurrent uh, operations? Can you provide with uh, um, uh, multiple commands? And, you know, indeed, this goes back to your question about the determinism. Maybe sometimes you don't mind so much about commands being uh, uh, run sequentially. Maybe you're happy with commands that can commute between them, and have you discussed this a little bit? Um, have you, or plan to? Okay. So, so anyway, so, so uh, um, yeah, so this is kind of, I think, one of the new interesting frontiers of research is extend the ideas from operating systems and from scheduling into kind of this world of blockchains. And I'll say the same thing about, I realize I'm, I'm running late. Um, uh, I'll say the same thing about uh, uh, storage systems. So just like uh, 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 execution is a whole interesting area, there's also kind of an area of storage. So the current Ethereum model is that you pay money to get space, and you get that space forever. And I don't know if you know, but like one of the big uh, type of denial of service attacks that happened on Ethereum was related to kind of uh, uh, buying, buying space. And I think you know, one of the approaches, the new approaches is actually to move to this rent model where instead of buying space, you actually spend money to get space for, for a certain limited amount of time. And you know, then you have to deal kind of with what happened if you didn't pay rent. So somehow, how do you uh, delete data? And also, if you paid rent, how do you guarantee that the information that you stored is actually stored? So this goes back to kind of all these interesting things about uh, proof of replication and proof of storage. And again, 